One second. Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Paul Buiting, and um, today we're going to interview Steve Keen. I'm going to do it together with uh, Martijn Jeroen van der Linde, who's working on his PhD on monetary reform at the Delft University of Technology. It's a great honor to have uh, Steve Keen again. We last interviewed him in November 2015. Uh, Steve is professor at Kingston University in London and author of books such as Debunking Economics and his latest, Can We Avoid Another Financial Crisis? Hi, Steve. Welcome. Good to be here. Just showing so, off the, the cover of the latest book there as we talk about it. Uh, check. Yep, great, yeah. excellent. Uh, <laughs> I, I was trying, I tried to, found, to find uh, debunking economics as well, um, but uh, it's somewhere hidden in my bookshelf, but I couldn't See find it straight away. Oh, okay, perfect. Oh, there you go. Good. Yep. <laughs> so we got them all. Um, Steve, uh, how have you been? Too busy. Uh, this, 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 it reminds me of one of the old jokes you often see about uh, about about by I've seen as some female friends of mine for just so many men so little time in my case there's so many economic fallacies so little time. <laughs> exactly. So your your book is uh, amongst others about um, economic fallacies, and you've also of course addressed some of these fallacies in uh, in your book debunking economics. Um, but let's let's um, discuss the main ones again from your latest book. Uh, and also for us to better understand how we can avoid another financial crisis. So what are the, the main fallacies you see in, in uh, modern economic science? Well, the main thing I'm focusing on this book is the, the fallacies over money uh, and also the fall combined fallacy with money and equilibrium. So uh, neoclassical, uh, mainstream, sorry, people who are not economists would think economists must be experts on money. The ironic thing is when you get inside economics, you realize they've actually persuaded themselves that money doesn't matter. So far from being experts on, on, on money, they're people who think you can model the economy without including bank debt or money in it. And that is simply absurd. The, the public attitude is that that can't be right is correct. Uh, and that's, of course, why they didn't see the financial crisis coming, because they weren't even looking at the, uh, at the point from which the crisis emanated. And they, can't, they still can't understand, and you can see this in the literature today, they still can't understand why banks, debt and money have any impact on the economy. So what I went through in the book here is, is why that's, uh, when you have a, a realistic view of money, why that's obvious that they have enormous impact. Uh, and it's also tied up with a whole fetish they had for modeling the economy as if it's in a continuous state of equilibrium or if it's disturbed from equilibrium, doesn't go too far and will always return to it. And of course, the fact that that's complete, those two uh, views are completely wrong is first of all, they didn't see the financial crisis coming. And secondly, why they can't understand why the aftermath has been what they call secular stagnation, but what is really credit stagnation. Yeah, but if, if I read your book, it, it seems all quite obvious to me. And also for many laymen, it seems obvious to have a proper definition and inclusion of money, uh, debt and banks in any kind of economic model in order to forecast things correctly. So how come then after the crisis that uh, these models haven't been updated or haven't been replaced by better ones? So because if, if we understand it, how come the government, bureaucrats or other people running the economy uh, don't understand it? The economy is not like a bridge. If you design a bridge badly, it tends to fall over and kill people. And, uh, and that makes it rather obvious it hasn't, wasn't well designed in the first place. With the economy, it's such a, an abstract concept in its own right, even though, of course, we, we wouldn't live without it. Uh, it's such an abstract concept, you can't get your hands on it. And you can, therefore, you have to rely upon a model of it. Now, if you rely upon a model, uh, it's ex exactly the same story as looking at the, uh, the universe. You'll start with a you, you start with a set of observations that lead you to a model. And of course, the obvious observation when you're, when you're a chimpanzee lying back in a tree in Africa uh, is that the stars and the sun and the moon and the planets orbit the Earth. Mm -hmm. and therefore, the Earth must be the center of the universe, and you have a wonderful model built up on that basis. And of course, because the model doesn't precisely fit the facts, you include a little uh, quirk that uh, all the planets you can see, I think you can see four planets with the naked eye, those four planets rotate on their own spheres, which you call epicycles. And with that model, you can very accurately pick where the stars are going to be, of course, because they can just continue orbiting, and where the planets are going to be, because the orbits on their orbits, you can actually mathematically work out in either direction. You have a wonderful model, why change? Mm. Comes along and tells you that, uh, in fact, um, that, that there, are, uh, there are comets, and the comets are, uh, undermine your theory. They'll say, no, 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 comets are atmospheric phenomena. Uh, see, the heavens are perfect and comets are moving and changing and therefore they must be, they can't be in their heavens, 
which is which are perfect. They must be in the atmosphere. Now, that's an analogy, obviously, but fundamentally, that's the same situation that neoclassical economists are in. They've got a model where money plays no role, where banks don't exist, where debt is irrelevant. The only debt that matters is government debt, not private debt. Uh, they, they can't see why it matters at the macroeconomic level. They may presume the system is in equilibrium and will return to it. Uh, when you try then to take all that and, and fit the real world into that, it doesn't. So all you do, if you if you try tinkering with the model, there's no point. You've got to throw the model out and start with, the, in the astronomical case, with one where the sun is the centre of the observable universe at the time, and from that you can progress. But economists are still clinging to what I'd call Ptolemaic economics. Mm -hmm. And why is that? Because in the aftermath of the financial crisis, many people have also criticised mainstream neoclassical science, uh, even Paul Romer, for, in for instance. But why don't they change their theories or in their models? Well, they're, they're human. Fundamentally, it's because they're human. Uh, and they don't have the benefit of other humans we call scientists, of having a set of experiments that can contradict belief. And uh, if, if, you read, if you know your history of economic thought and history of, uh, of philosophy of science, you'll know there have been episodes in the past where humanity uh, in other disciplines has been confronted by a complete contradiction to their beliefs. And the reaction was to effectively you know, ostracize the person who criticized the beliefs rather than saying, well, great, thanks very much. You've improved our understanding of the universe. Let's go on to a new theory. So, for example, we all know that uh, there are what are called irrational numbers. You know, the square root of, of two is an obvious irrational number. Um, that was a travesty when it was first found that there was, in fact, such a thing as an irrational number uh, by the Pythagoreans who that one of the elements of the Pythagorean school of geometry was that all numbers can be described as a ratio of two integers. Now, when one of their members proved that this root of five happens by drowning in the Mediterranean. But, uh, of course, because they couldn't get rid of the obvious proof, ultimately, that the square root of two and the square root of three and the square root of five are all irrational numbers, they finally developed, uh, accepted that complete change in their mental framework and developed the mathematics that led to Newton and Newton led through to complex numbers and we now have things about the square root of negative numbers um, but physics had a similar thing with Max Planck solving mm -hmm. what's called the the, the, yeah. uh, the, the black body radiation problem by doing uh, as it happens integration in the complex plane and finding the solution involved a, uh, a constant which meant that energy came in in small discrete units he called quanta now, he gave up trying to persuade his fellow physicists of that and finally coined that wonderful phrase that science advances one funeral at a time. Yeah. So the reason why they haven't changed their minds is, A, there haven't been enough funerals, and, B, yeah. uh, we, we, we don't have an experiment like that which, which gives you something which strongly contradicts the underlying theorem. Yeah. So they, they will continue going back to their belief system no matter what. I think it's clear, Or. Yeah. Yeah, so if we would um, use uh, the models that you advocate for, what, what, does, uh, what does it say now? What do your models say about the, the current uh, economy? And, and uh, because you asked the question, of course, can we avoid another financial crisis? Is another financial yeah. crisis coming soon? Or what is your, what is your, uh, your own forecast there? Well, it depends on the country you're in. If you're in uh, Japan or America or the UK or Europe, you've already had a crisis. Uh, Japan back in 1990, America in 2008, uh, the UK and, uh, and Europe 2008-2010. Uh, and that crisis was caused, first of all, by a boom, which was driven by rising private debt. And one of the main elements of my argument that uh, is novel in terms of it's something which I've had to persuade my own post-Keynesian school of over time, uh, is the total demand in the economy is the sum of the turnover of existing money plus credit. Now, the mainstream model, when they think about banks at all, they, they just dismiss them by this model where they treat banks as intermediaries and say that a bank doesn't actually originate loans. A bank introduces a saver to a borrower mm -hmm. and then charges yeah. commission on the exchange between the two. That is, to quote a phrase of mine from the past, that is total, total bullshit. And it's been called as bullshit by the Bank of England. Exactly. Yeah, there was a watershed, watershed moment. Recently, the, bank, the Bundesbank and the Norwegian Central Bank have all come out and said that's nonsense. They said banks actually originate loans. And when they originate loans, what they do is they, rather than like if, if, you, if you just have a loan between one non-bank person and another, that simply shuffles 
the money between uh, two different people bank accounts without increasing the aggregate volume of bank accounts. When you have a bank originating a loan, it creates a debt on one side of its ledger and an additional liability to itself on the other, which is an increase in a deposit account. And that increase in the deposit account is spent. Yeah, but everyone you knows that right now, right? because the, the central banks have, yeah. have all admitted that. And uh, and also, for example, the work from Kumov is, is, ever, is very important yeah. there. So that's a given now, right? Um, but because, but given, given that fact, um, you, there's still no appetite for the alternative models as developed by Minsky, yourself and others. Oh, no. And they, they always want to squeeze it back into an equilibrium framework. So it isn't just leaving out banks, debt and money. It's also believing the economy either... Re- it's, it's, they made a modelling choice in the 19th century, which was ra- mm-hmm. rational at the time, that if you're going to try to model something as complex as the economy, you'd have to assume it's an equilibrium to make it feasible. And if you read people like Jevons and Marshall and uh, and J.B. Clark, when they wrote about it, they thought, well, we, we know we've made a compromise. We know we're making dynamics. We're talking about out of equilibrium phenomena, restricting ourselves just to equilibrium is a crutch of techniques we currently have and we'll leave it to our successors to do the dynamics well a century and a half later virtually what they call dynamics any mathematician would laugh out of court yeah and they they have a they have a dynamic process they presume it returns to equilibrium even when the model they're building it on which is in the case of the dsg models it's the ramsey growth model from the 1920s the ramsey growth model had an unstable equilibrium now, they simply presume the economy is inhabited by godlike creatures, who they call rational, uh, who can work out the only path to get to an unstable equilibrium. And that is a mathematical travesty. If you have an unstable equilibrium, it is unstable. But they presume, why is this unstable? But these, these rational agents can work out what the, uh, the root is to this unstable equilibrium and get there, despite its instability. In which case, why do you need a market? They have a model of an economy consisting of gods. Yeah. Why do you need anything? The gods can coordinate themselves any way they damn well like. <laughs> so it ends up, they're simply not realize, aware, aware of how absurd their modeling structures are uh, because all the things they hope they could prove mathematically, largely relating to the stability of equilibrium, so a market economy could find out the equilibrium on its own, uh, they've got to presume everybody in the market economy is God to find out what the equilibrium is and get there. Yeah, and your own models um, from t- 25 onwards, a few years afterwards, that you, you basically saw the previous global financial crisis coming, or at least what was going on in, in the States. Mm. You could you could predict based on, uh, on GDP and private debt numbers. Um, if you mm-hmm. your own model again, I think you also, you also talk about it in your book, what are the sort of the zombie countries or the countries that um, have the highest likelihood of running into a, a big financial crisis again? Yeah, well, that's countries like China, clearly, Australia, Canada, which you'd expect, and some other countries you wouldn't expect, including Korea, Belgium, Norway and Sweden, and possibly uh, uh, Singapore, Thailand and uh, Malaysia. Uh, These are countries which all have a substantial level of private debt, so a minimum of close to 1.5 times GDP, and in some cases 2.6 times GDP. And they're they're also having a debt rising faster than GDP, which means credit growth, credit credit is, is larger. So the change in debt, which is credit, is larger than the change in the increase in GDP. So you have a, a growing debt burden in those economies. And uh, part of what causes, causes a crisis is the level of debt is too high to begin with. And the demand in the economy is too dependent upon that debt level continuing to rise. So all you have to have to have a crisis is the rate of growth of debt slowing down to the same as GDP. So a simple stabilisation of the debt ratio is enough to cause a crisis. And uh, this will happen at some point because no economy can sustain an, an, an infinite amount of debt. The maximum any economy has ever sustained, I think, was the Netherlands economy, which had, a, in terms of a large economy, about 2.4 times GDP was its debt level. So these countries, Australia, Canada, Korea, uh, China, were all up in between 2 and 2.4 times, 2.5 times GDP as a debt level, and what can when they, they do stabilize to, uh, the debt ratio, they'll have a crisis. And what can they do uh, to avoid this? Is there, and also to answer the question in, uh, of your book, is there something they can do to to kind of uh, um, stop this disaster from, from happening? They, can, it's, they can't stop it from happening because the only way it can stop it from happening is to continue having debt rising faster than GDP. So it has to happen. 
question is when it happens, what can you do to attenuate the damage? And the easiest thing to do, well, not easiest, but the, the way that it gives you the lowest level of pain is to use the state's capacity to create money, to cancel debt-based debt money, mm -hmm. and what I call a modern debt jubilee. Use the government's capacity to create money to give everybody effectively a tax credit. And then if those people who receive the tax credit are in debt, then their debt is reduced by the amount of the tax credit. But if people are not in debt, so if they're in, we've invited commas savers, they get a cash injection they can spend. And that way you don't crush demand in the economy to when you reduce the level of private debt. But otherwise, if you rely upon normal private sector uh, dynamics, then when people try to reduce the debt, they'll also reduce GDP. The debt ratio won't fall particularly, but you'll end up in a depression. And how uh, should governments put this in practice? Yeah, it's actually been done once by Australia, and mm -hmm. that was in 2008. It literally was a tax credit. So this has actually happened after I scared the pants off the Prime Minister there uh, by being interviewed on the leading current affairs program one day, and he was interviewed on the same program the next day and harangued by the interviewer about my views. And one week later, he came out with a stimulus program, part of which involved restarting the housing bubble. So they doubled and trebled the amount of money they gave to first home buyers to encourage them back into the market again. That was by far the most effective thing they did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they also gave every household that had paid their taxes a, a tax rebate of roughly $1,000. just turned up in your bank account. Mm -hmm. And, of course, people people spent that money, and by spending it, they stimulated the economy. So on that basis, plus, the unfortunately, the housing bubble restart, Australia is one of only two countries to avoid a recession back in 2007, 2008, the other being South Korea. Of course, the way they avoided it was by continuing to increase their level of private debt, yeah. which is why they now face other crisis again uh, in the next couple of years. Yeah, so Australia has just, just been buying time then. Um, yeah, and On borrowed money. Yeah, so Martijn and I live in Holland. You just, uh, you just mentioned Holland um, mm -hmm. as, as also a country with a high private debt level. Um, uh, people could also argue, well, we also have a lot of assets. Um, and also a lot of pension uh, reserves. Uh, is your metric a, a gross debt number or a, a net private debt number? It's always gross because net debt is one of these little tricks that says, oh, I'm going to value my house at its current price and subtract that from the amount of debt that I get. And hey, I've got, I've got, I've got no, no net debt at all. The current price is actually maintained by the increase in private debt. So if you, have a, if you suddenly have a, people uh, ceasing to borrow money, uh, for their houses, then the house price will crash. And then what looked like a good financial situation beforehand, net debt you know, zero or positive, uh, or the net debt negative, suddenly becomes net debt massively positive because the asset prices collapse in value, but you still owe the same amount of money on them. So yeah. it's a very, but like very pensions, dangerous... for example, are, are pensions, uh, could you or could or should you deduct that from the debt level? Because of course, that is also... No, no, I because it's also because the reason for using gross, gross debt is credit. If you, and that's what I'm saying. If you have to focus upon the role of credit in the economy. So if you net out, uh, and credit itself increases the value of assets. So if you take out more housing debt, you drive up the value of house prices. And if you work out the net between the two, you get a small change. But if you take a look at the gross alone, you can see how much more leverage is driving up house prices mm -hmm. and how much that leverage is also necessary for maintaining demand in the economy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Holland is also toast. But, and, uh, not? So Holland is also toast then in your book as a, as yeah, a, as a, as a Canada country for another crisis. Yeah, the Netherlands actually describe as I, I describe the world and divide the world into two main major categories, the, what I call the walking debt of debt. And those are countries that have had a debt crisis, either with Japan back in 1990 or most of the rest of the world in 2008. And now they've got declining levels of private debt uh, compared to GDP. And for a while they had negative credit as well. And then in the situation, they're going to be just like Japan has been for 25 years, zombified by the fact they've lost credit demand from their economy, generally speaking. So demand's going to be deficient. Um, but they they can't reduce the debt level itself because of that feedback. When you reduce debt, you also reduce GDP. So they're stuck with a high level of debt to GDP, not much credit-based demand and stagnant economies. They're the walking debt of debt. The other main category 
for economies that avoided the crisis back in 2008 by just continuing to borrow. So Australia, when the crisis hit, had a on the BIS figures had a private debt level of about, of about 1.8 times GDP. It's now between 2.1 and 2.2 times GDP. So it borrowed its way out of trouble. But of course now. When, when its credit slows down, it'll have that much larger an impact than it would have had if that had a crisis back in 2008. There are some countries which don't quite fit there, and the Netherlands is one. I'd actually call it Schrodinger's zombie. It's both, it's both a zombie and not a zombie all at once, and may become a zombie once more because you are so dependent upon credit demand and you have a, GDP, a credit level, I think, of about 2.3 times GDP. Mm -hmm. Or a debt level, 2.3 times GDP. Yeah, so that's what really surprises me. So after the financial crisis, there hasn't been a real deleverage. So we have still high levels no. of private debt. So and also there. So if you look at Minsky or also other post keynesian li uh, literature, then you would e would expect uh, much more deleveraging. And why didn't that happen? Well, mainly because we didn't have a second world war. Mm. If you look back at the Great Depression, I mean, if you, you take a look at the level of debt in America when the crisis began in 1930, and then compare that to uh, the end of 1945, the level of debt fell by a factor of three or four, pretty, pretty much like. But when 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 the Second World War ended, uh, that period began with a level of debt about one third the level that it was when the when the 19, when the crisis began in 1930, even though that for a while there actually rose because of deflation. So you had a very very low level of debt, and the large reason for it was the enormous government stimulus. Uh, of all the government spending during the Second World War, plus the restraint on private spending by all the all the rationing, uh, meant that for corporations could pay their debt down and so could households without subtracting from aggregate demand because the government was producing so much of the demand. And if you look at the scale of deficit that was run at the time, and on I think in 1940, England spent England's deficit, government deficit, was 35% of GDP. Mm. Now. They, they, they start to wet their pants these days when they get a deficit of 3% of GDP. Now, if you imagine back in 1940, what would happen to any parliamentarian who said, we can't afford to buy that bomb, otherwise our children will be in, in poverty forever. Yep. I said, yeah, they're in poverty forever in speaking German. <laughs> so, pardon me. So, uh, you know, therefore there's no restraint on the amount of government spending because it was so enormous. Uh, it enabled the private sector to delever without okay. depressing the economy. Yeah. The economy was fully employed in the war effort. Uh, this time round, rather, we haven't had anything of that scale. And what the governments have tried to do is encourage people back into debt. So yeah. if you look at the, um, the the programs that particularly Bernanke was responsible for, a major factor there, we thought well, we have to get the banks lending again. And that's because they don't realise that there's too much bank debt to begin with. QE's done the same sort of thing. So the authorities, rather, rather than an enabling deleveraging to occur, have actually been trying to encourage releveraging mm, mm. without realising that they're already so close to the ceiling level of debt that these economies can carry mm. that they'll never get any particular level of demand out of it. Right. And they so, don't think they get demand out of it either. That's the other weird thing. I mean, some of the nonsense these people believe is just breathtaking. So on the one hand, we should um, uh, implement something like modern... A debt, debt jubilee, and on the other hand, I guess we also then need to try to restrain um, private debt growth, or or make sure it yeah. will be more for like productive um, purposes, um, uh, companies building a factory, uh, or something like that, instead of um, bubbles in the stock market or any other kind of uh, like real estate market. Um, is that that's right? But, but and, and how that's how, true. how that's what I'd like to do? Yeah. So and how would you go about that? Well, you have to make it unprofitable for banks to finance asset price speculation. If you look at what they do right now, 90% or more of the money they create uh, just goes to finance real estate mm -hmm. and share buybacks. And that, that, what, that, what that purchase, those purchases do is drive up asset prices. And the logic is quite simple. It's complicated mathematics, but the logic is quite straightforward. If you think about what is demand, monetary demand for housing, it's fundamentally new mortgages. And if you divide the, the new mortgages, which is the, money, the, the flow of monetary demand per year for housing, by the price level, you get a rough idea of how many the flow of demand for new houses every year. So that gives you a relationship between mortgage credit, which is change in mortgage debt, and the level of house prices. So you get a relationship as a result of that. If you change, look at the change of that in respect to time, you get a relationship between change in mortgage credit which is acceleration of mortgage debt and change in house prices. And in a causal sense, the, the, the driving force there is the change in mortgage credit. 
So changing mortgage credit, which is acceleration of mortgage debt, is what drives house prices. So we're, we're caught in a positive feedback loop between acceleration of debt and change yeah. in house price. Yeah. But would you then suggest something like window guidance or credit guidance that central banks um, determine which sectors of the economy get credit and which not? No, I don't. First of all, bureaucrats are easily outmaneuvered by credit creators. This has mm. always been the case. I speak to plenty of people in the banking sector in the UK who tell me that they think it's quite funny. They get invited to hear what new laws are going to be at the, at the Bank of England. So when they're sitting there, it's a bit like criminals being told what the new laws are going to be for controlling the drug trade um, and being discussing the laws before they're actually implemented. And so we're sitting there listening to these new proposals and we're actually in the back of our minds and we're nodding in front of our faces and at the back of our brain we're thinking, okay, how can we evade this set of regulations? Mm. So I don't think you can do it by regulation. I think you have to do it by a change in the legal structure of banking. And I would bring in, in terms of, the mortgage market, I'd bring in one control, which is the maximum amount that can be borrowed against a property would be some factor of the income earning capacity of the asset. Mm -hmm. So not what you think the price is going to be, not what you allegedly have as a, you know, a link between the income of the borrow and the, and the purchase price. Just say for a particular house, which has a rental income, let's say of 20,000 euro a year, the maximum anyone can borrow to buy it is 200,000. Mm -hmm. If any borrows, body borrows more than two hundred thousand to buy it, they forfeit the house. Mm -hmm. Now, if you set that up in that way, first of all, you take away the encouragement we all have to compete against each other with more leverage. Yeah. Because at the moment, if you and I are fighting over the same place, we both had the same income. The one of us who would win would be the one who got more bank leverage, more bank debt. So we actually have a positive encouragement to have rising levels of debt compared to income. Uh, but if you change to this system then the amount of leverage we get is maxed out. We, but neither of us could use that example of a house selling for two, uh, renting for 200,000 euro or 20,000 euro a year. Neither of us could borrow more than 200,000. So the one who would win would be the one who saves more money from their salary. Yeah. So that, but, that, that takes away that particular loop. So, so in that sense, you put a lot of faith in the hand of, of, um, of the government and central banks and regulation in order to avoid uh, another private debt buildup. No, um, I'd, I'd put it in the hand of, I'd put it in the, hand of the, the, the judges and the court system. Yeah, well, basically um, the, 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 the state then. Well, the, the thing is, that if, if judges, if, if you've seen what regulators have done, uh, the Australian, Australian situation is quite classic on this front. They think of the Australian Prudential Regulation Authority actually was sending off its press releases about controlling one of the banks to one of the banks to get the bank's approval before the press release was sent out. Oh. <laughs> now, I've never seen a judge send a note to a convicted criminal, to a criminal who's you know, being tried to say, uh, what would you like us to try you for? No, but so like a, with, with you, yeah. But an, an Austrian economist or, or like a, a, a maybe classical economist could argue, isn't the state the problem here by allowing banks to create all that money in the first place and, and supporting them with uh, central banks and, and the post insurance schemes and other kind of bail bailouts? What would you think of that argument? Well, the banks have always been able to create credit. Banks have always been, uh, ever since banks existed, they've created money. Um, so it isn't, isn't a case. The, the one thing that lets a bank create money is the social license to have a bank. Yeah. And people who are in favour of this are saying, well, let's just deregulate completely and let anybody set up their own bank and we'll uh, compete between the banks and the, the people will choose the more responsible bank and therefore we'll weed out the bad ones and it will be absolutely beautiful. I think it's so totally naive. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's amusing to hear Austrians coming out with this stuff because they're normally ones who talk about limited information and limited knowledge and so on. And yet when it comes to banking, they're willing to imagine, just like neoclassicals, that individuals in society are godless entity, are godlike entities who can work out what's a responsible bank and what's not and will put their money with a sensible one rather than the irresponsible one. Bullshit. Uh, what they will do is they'll take for the bank with the, promising the biggest return, we'll get Ponzi schemes and booms and busts and crashes. And that's just what we had in the 19th century. Now, anybody can argue that and not remember little things like the tulip craze or the South Sea bubble and so on. It sounds a bit like the, the cryptocurrency. It sounds a bit like cryptocurrency investing at the moment. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There are bubbles. People, yeah. people do not. They, 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 even the Austrians are happy to assume that people will be intelligent and responsible and avoid irresponsible banking. They're saying everybody in the world is like Hayek. 
everybody is responsible, mm -hmm. like Hayek. Crap. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I know your time time constraint. I have a, Martijn has, a, I think, a final, a before we briefly also discuss your Patreon project, but then uh, Martijn, I think you have a nice yeah. philosoph philosophical question to kind of uh, uh, to end with. Actually, I had, I had one, more one more question, if okay. I'm allowed. I had also the question, yeah. uh, what about proposals of, uh, for instance, uh, Michael Kumov of Positive Money in UK to really implement monetary reform and in a way to end banking? Yeah, that's the trouble. Um, two, two things are wrong about that. First of all, even though I am very much in favour of much more government money creation we have right now, mm -hmm. I'm not in favour of bureaucrats deciding the amount of money in the economy because they'll get it wrong, for sure. Yeah. Probably they'll could create too little rather than too much. And then when that happens, the, the bankers will still be there. They'll just be doing something else, you know, card sharks or that sort of thing. Um, they will come back and say, look, we work much better when we were in control. And because people forget these things... Uh, we'll get the bankers back in there again and we'll be back in the same bloody situation once more. Uh, that's the negative reason. The positive reason is that I actually think there is a role for private uh, private entities to create money if that creation of money goes towards innovation. Yeah. Because, again, I don't trust bureaucrats to work out what products deserve, you know, what, what new ideas deserve to be given a financial chance. I've seen enough of their capacity to stuff up innovation in academic research, not to want them to be making decisions on finance. But to make that possible, banks have to be able to make a profit when they fund people who are going to lose money. So yeah. the only way you can do that is by effectively making a hybrid between venture capital, which which exists now, but does it on borrowed money or, or equity funds and real banking and let banks who are entrepreneurial banks take, a, take an equity position in the firms they lend to, so that if five out of six fail but one succeeds, they make a capital gain out of the one that does. So something like that. But it's just all public money. I am just expect that to be. Um, we, we have to find a way that we make the money create an in innovative fashion as well as a, a long term stodgy responsible one. Yeah, clear. And then my more philosophical question is, so you criticize in your book, Debunking Economics, and I think also in your other books, you criticize new, new, classical, new classical science, and in particular also the view of the homo economicus or utilitarianism and Bentham's mm. view of the human yeah. being. And what, is you, uh, and what kind of view of the human being do you propose or do you use here modeling? Well, my foundation is actually a non-orthodox interpretation of Marx. Mm -hmm dialectical philosophy which contradicts the labor theory of value yeah. and starts from an objective theory of value but then builds subjective layers above that and it's something which i first did back in 19 when was that 1989 90 when i wrote my master's thesis it's something which i've had at the back of my mind all the way as i've been doing on my own modeling on minsky and, and building my own overall economic orient of interpretation and i think now when i write my next book i have to give a, a long explanation of that because you can't get a decent foundation for our macroeconomics out of a subjective theory of value. Yeah, exactly. That's what the neoclassicals yeah, have proven. Really the, the, Austri yeah. the Austrians waffle about it. We need to get a new foundation which enables us to start at an objective level, which makes sense for the how we actually produce the surplus in the first place and yeah. distribution of income at that level, but ends up being able to support subjective levels of valuation as well. Things like how new how new how asset prices are set, how um, how people value new products that sort of thing. And this dialectical foundation I've got does enable me to do that. Clear, thank you. I'm looking forward to it. I've got to write yeah. it. That's one way back to the Patreon campaign. Yeah, that's a, that's okay. a, nice, yeah. a nice bridge to the Patreon campaign because if I understand correctly, Steve, you want to stop being a professor and want to be full-time working on as a, as a renegade economist, uh, so you will, uh, funded by the crowd. That's basically it. I mean, the universities have been ruined by 40 years of neoliberal policies over here. And the last uh, the, the, the last straw for me in Australia was back in 2012, I think it was, or maybe 2013, when the government decided to make the first year and take more like a market by deregulating controls on how many positions universities could offer for different subjects. Of course, what happened was uh, the, the, the top-ranked universities offered more humanities positions because they're cheap to teach. And students who used to have to give five preferences, one, two, three, four, five, uh, and used to put uh, Western Sydney, where I worked, as one if they didn't expect to get uh, into um, to New South Wales or Sydney, because you had a high, you needed a higher tertiary entrance mark to get into one of those. So they'd, they'd put some 
uh, enough students would put us down as a first preference, and we'd get about we got about 120 first preferences every year. Well, when they deregulated the numbers, we went from 120 to 16 in one year. Not mm. because students thought we had a shit economics degree; they didn't. They didn't know. Still, students are uninformed about what is actually taught at universities and mm. simply think the higher ranked university must be better. And that's why they abandoned us. But I was speaking of abandoning guys. So the same thing happened here in, in, in England that ruined my, the, the, the financial viability of my program at Kingston. And I've had enough of it. So I want to go out and not have that crap happen a third time and just be a public intellectual with support of, of people who want economics changed uh, in the public. And so far, I'm about one third of the way to replacing my academic salary so I can work full time as an economic rebel. Sounds great. Well, everyone uh, watching this show, please check it out. I'll put it, the link in the show notes. Uh, it's patreon.com something something, but I'll put it in the, li in the notes. Or maybe you can also say it now, um, Steve. It's uh, patreon.com slash Prof. Steve Kane. Perfect. Uh, so uh, I would uh, recommend everyone to take a look and also to uh, check the book, buy it, and uh, write a review online. It was great to have you on again, uh, Steve, and uh, hopefully your campaign will be successful and uh, we get to hear and see a lot more from you. Thank you. Thanks, mate. I'm off to play tennis right now. So see you later. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Good evening. Thanks. Bye. Bye.